On today's episode of Gathering the Kings. I didn't walk across the stage. I had to finish during the summer. Just to let you know, nobody gives you anything. Yeah. Nobody gives you anything. I was a start of, nobody's coming to help you. Yeah. It's time to buckle in. Do you think that's like maybe the seed of what you said earlier? One of your parts of what beats inside of you is to do it right. Do you think that maybe stems from that angle? In that moment, you made a decision that like, I'm going to do life on purpose now rather than reactionary? What's up, everybody? I'm Chaz Wolf, Gathering the Kings podcast, coming to you, your host, Got J.D. Broadwater here on the King stage, my brother J.D. How we doing? Doing good, brother. Thank you for uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, man. I'm excited for this conversation. We've been trying to do this what for seems like forever, but here we are, two freaking studs. Actually, you know, this is I know your background a little bit, so I'm I'm kind of leading in here, giving the, giving the listeners a little bit of taste here. But we both have an extensive sales background, so this conversation could be very, very intense and interesting. And so I'm excited for that. Also excited to be able to talk about all the other cool things that, that you're great at, I'm sure. Tell us what kind of business that you got, JD. So we, we are a smart home security company based out of Birmingham. So we are heavily involved in our builder community. So you, you build a house more than likely here in Birmingham, I would say we, we have about 70% of that market where you'll move in there'll be a, a touch screen there'll be a video doorbell there the builder will provide for a smart lock and a thermostat so that homeowner really moves into really a starter smart package yeah um, you know it's, it's it's sort of what people are expecting now especially when they build a house dr horton really sort of started that trend but a lot of builders now are really following suit to that which is great for us um mm -hmm. and so you move into that house our guys go out, they meet with you at orientation, tell you exactly what to expect. And what's in it for us, obviously, is, you know, the security portion of it to, to right. get the, the monitoring of the security. So that's probably one of the, the bulk of our business. And then really branching out into commercial as well. So we're, we're trying to branch out into bigger, higher revenue jobs that's sort of my role this year is to go out and explore that yeah um, so yeah that's what we look like that's awesome man appreciate the the almost like inner inner parts there because i just built a home and we moved in i don't know maybe just over a year ago and everything that you just described did not happen for me and i was like why what like i'm hodgepodge it together myself as the homeowner Luckily, I know a guy and a, and another guy, and we put you know we did it all together. But man, just to walk into what you just said, that would have been glorious as far as like a customer experience perspective, you know? Well, yeah, I mean for sure. I mean if you <laughs> if you're a builder and you're let's say you're not a builder, let's say you're a homeowner, and I'm looking at three different neighborhoods, love the layout of all three of them, but this one comes with the smart home package and a company that is really trusted that does, you know, that'll hang my TVs. If I want a sound bar, they'll do all of that. So they're not your traditional, we are not your traditional ADT Vivint kind of companies. I mean, right. that's where I came from, but we do things a little bit different. So we, we can hang your TVs, we can do the audio, we can do everything to make the move super easy for you. So I think that really makes us a little bit different when, when we can handle everything, because, yeah. you know, there's a lot going on when people are moving and, and oh, yeah. sometimes they can't see straight. Oh yeah. Most times you can't yeah. see straight. In fact, you, <laughs> you move so many times oftenly, or at least I have at least. And you're like, you know what? I'm not ever doing that again. And then it always comes back up and you always make You're like, am I going to do that? I told myself last time I wasn't going to. So <laughs> yeah. I, I appreciate that because I've, I've since then done a lot of what you do for people. And I think that that would have been way better to have a guy like you, but I want to know, kind of getting into a little bit of your background and kind of what makes you tick and stuff like that. Before we get into the super like X's and O's, what makes JD wake up? What's the burning desire? What's the bigger picture? Okay, so you're installing cool stuff, but like, why? I could give you the generic answer of helping others, but that's part of it. But I'm really competitive. I just, I wake up and I start at zero. And I look in the mirror and say, we're either going to kill it today or we're not. And it starts with you. So I'm really competitive. 
I used to have a leaderboard when I was a sales rep and I would I would be chasing the number one spot. Not really yeah. for revenue because that sort of stuff comes with the with the territory if you're, you know, selling if you're the number one person in the country. Yeah. But there's just something about just me dominating the outside yeah. competition. So I would say that's sort of what drives me right now is for us to absolutely just explode and be the biggest security company in the Southeast. That's what's driving me now. And then another thing would be to do it right. You know, I was a technician for a long time before I went into sales and then before I left and partnered with this company here. And I've just seen so many companies that really do a terrible job and you can tell they didn't care about the customer they right. they got in they got out they took advantage of the customer they didn't explain the terms a lot of a lot of bad practices out there and so i want to be somebody that's that that is open and does it right we yeah. don't always get it right obviously yeah but we're at least going to tell you exactly how much it costs and how long you're going to be paying that and we're also going to make the installation look like it should. Yeah. Nothing like installing a system. Really, it could be of any kind, any anything in my home or anything in my business. But we're talking security. Okay, fine. Nothing to install a security system and then years later need or think one thing and you make a phone call and they tell you something else. And you're like, wait a second. That was, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> yeah. You didn't tell me I was in a 10-year contract. <laughs> yeah, that that actual conversation happened and and i took ownership and said you know poo poo on me i should have read the contract better i guess but holy moly 10 years in small print and so that's that's a big deal yeah, yeah it's a bummer yeah okay so you're out to dominate and to do it right i i've got a kind of a follow-up question I, I love this question actually i used to ask my sales reps this all the time are you a love to win or are you a hate to lose person oh i probably hate to lose I do love to win, but I don't celebrate it very much. I, it, I forget about it pretty quick. So yeah. I, I, I'm more eat up by, by somebody beating you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, my wife runs a, a fitness company and sort of started off as CrossFit and now it's, you know, it, it's, it's different, but I, I still do a bunch of, of those competitions and things like that. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, winning one is great you're beat up and you're proud that you did it but it, you know the next day it, you know other than maybe some people commenting on your facebook that you crushed right. or something that you know you sort of forget about it but yeah. if you lose and you knew you could have done better that really like sits with you for a while yeah yeah <laughs> there's there's a emotion attached to loss and so the matter of how we process that i think that determines whether we love to win or hate to lose and so some of the greatest competitors out there are hate to lose individuals. There's no right or wrong answer. It, it really, when you said the word dominate though, I actually wondered if you would answer the other way because dominating or winning, yes, there's competition involved, but really at a domination stage, who are you competing with? Like you said, you're 70% of the market share. Like who are you running after? Who's beating you? Who's even close? Probably nobody, but I guess now you've got to just set your sights on something bigger. Now you said the Southeast. Now we're trying to be the biggest in the Southeast. So there's probably somebody bigger than you now. So is that kind of how you think about it? Like, that's who I'm after now, or that's the target? Yeah, I mean, I would say we're so we're, we're about 70% on new construction. Now, you know, I also came from the biggest security company in the world for 13 years and they dominate the retail space, right? They dominate right. the phones, they dominate the commercial, they dominate the internet. So I would say, yes, we, we are doing a killer job in the builder world, which they don't really um, right. care much about. They're, you know, they're gonna spend millions of dollars on advertising. So there's all, there is another flip side to this coin that we've gotta get better at. Right. Because obviously, you know, you're talking about some monster companies that are out there. Yeah. I would love to to go head to head with them, and uh, you know we we will. You know, just depends on if if we believe that we can do it or not. Yeah, the the action there that you just described of that. There's another side of the coin. Okay, we we're good over here, or we're, we're pretty good. Obviously, you're not going to like stop getting better at dealing with you know builders, but 
there is a whole nother area that you guys can not only get into, but start winning and dominating. And so what do you think that like, I mean, the listener right now, depending upon they're in the trades or they're in security or they're in marketing or they're in, I don't know, the airspace, you know, there's always going to be another opportunity or another vertical or another thing that they can go win in. How do you know when to go win in another vertical? Like, okay, is it 70%? So now we're like, okay, we feel pretty good. And so now let's go take a look at retail or is it a different formula? How do you think about that? I don't think you. I don't think you could or sh- or should be moving on to the next vertical, and and unless you say you're closing seventy percent of the vertical that you're super focused on. So when we're in that market, we're when you know if we if we have a if I have a, a sales rep that that has ten appointments of those a month, we expect to close six or seven out of them. They're the hottest leads that you can possibly get. So I would say. First, perfect the process of your your first baby, the, the one that, that you wanted to go out and go after first. Yeah. And then after you feel like you've gotten a good handle on it and a good process to keep that process going, then move on to the next one. And, and you have to take, I mean, it took us two years before we ever talked builders into, you know, letting us or spending the money to put panel and a doorbell in then back then, like right. I said, they didn't need to do any of that stuff to sell a house two years ago. Yeah. So, you know, I would say perfect the first one and then really start learning what it takes to, to dominate the second aspect of it. But don't, don't, don't try to do too many things at one time or, or you're, you're going to really drop the balls and all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. I do a lot of things half well. You know, there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there that kind of reach the first initial glass ceiling and they think that it's just time to go open up another business. And and I would say that then there's certain personalities, mine being one of them, which I, I like a lot of things going on at once. And so if you're that type of person and you're listening, it's like, okay, well, there's there's a lot of opportunity inside of this one vertical, even the 70 percent. Like you could really dial that down and go, OK, well, what's the other 30 percent or how do we shield from a a looming recession. Like there's so many angles that you could go to still yet dial down further and still like have this presence of something new or exciting, you know, as an entrepreneur to work on. It's a good perspective. I want to ask you about a good decision that you've made, but I want you to kind of like, tell me your story. You said 13 years with a competitor or maybe not even competitor because you guys do something a little bit different, but 13 years in the industry and you transitioned to your, your own deal. Obviously you've got some quite a bit of success behind you. Why did you transition out? Why not just keep being a salesperson? Give us the story. Yeah, so I worked for the three letter, you know, <laughs> the other one, the big <laughs> one for, I feel like I, I promote them a lot because I say the name a lot. So I'm trying. Yeah, uh-huh. that's good. About. So I worked there for like 13 years, nine of them, the technician, and then went four years into sales and really moving to Birmingham from a small town in Alabama and immediately, you know, working there and sort of figuring out what I wanted to do. You know, I got, there was a, there was a time in in my career where I wasn't getting along with, you know, my bosses and just sort of had a bad attitude and I had to get surgery on my wrist. I tell people this all the time. I had to get surgery on my wrist, and during those 30 days, I just sort of recommitted myself and came back in there and said, listen, I, I apologize for being disrespectful, and I'm going to be the best technician that you, you've ever had. So wow. I did change everything and then you know, refocus my mind. And Why did so, you do that? Or like, what, what caused that? I mean, obviously, there was an injury that made you think a little bit, but what was the deeper story there? Why? I was just tired of being being just not getting along with people you know i'm a very competitive person but i'm also very like one of my traits is restorative so i don't like there being friction and things and i know that you know i was causing most of it i went from having a boss that was very very cool and then the next thing i know i had two bosses sort of like office space i had two bosses you know and i was like do i need two bosses and so we just didn't really get along there for a little bit, all because of me and, and my attitude. And so I really had to, I had to check myself and say, I mean, do I want to continue coming to work every day with this attitude, 
Or do I want to look in the mirror and say, no, this is all you. You're the one that created this. So the, the 30 days off with the wrist surgery was sort of a blessing. I came back, said I'm going to be the best technician that you've ever had. I really did focus hard on that. And then in, in the meantime of that, you know, there's all kinds of sales competitions. And I was just killing it, just killing it. I won like every one of them. And uh, my mom and my dad, my wife was like, I think you're pretty good at sales. And I was like, <laughs> I'm just in their house and they trust me. And so after some belief some with some people that believed in me, you know, I made the jump to sales and you're talking about a lot of sales reps. And within three or four mm -hmm. years, I was ranked number one, just jumped the, the ladder and came from the bottom of the barrel. And next, you know, next year I was ranked seventh and then fifth. And then I was like, wow, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm killing it. <laughs> I'm pretty good at talking. So, you know, that, that's sort of how that transition I caught some attention of some business partners here in Birmingham who were running a massive pest control company, like 150,000 customers. Now oh. it's way more than that. But he, he wanted to get into this vertical because it's not too far. They're pretty much the similar. And so me looking at, you know, can I continue to just crush it year after year? I was confident that I could do that. But I don't know if I would have learned too much more about yeah. myself or leadership or anything like that. So, so yeah, it was hard. You know, I, I left and we basically started started from nothing. I was the security expert. I was leaned on heavily to figure it out, yeah. and we sort of built a security system, security company, along with an AV company that we had purchased and brought those two together. And so, yeah, I mean, I was your first sales rep, first technician. I installed first right. technician out of a Hyundai Tucson. And now we've got, I don't know, 40 <laughs> vehicles. So it's been wow. sort of wild, but yeah, that's where I'm sure, I'm sure it has been wild to see that, especially coming from a, a sales rep position at another company and, and really where it is all about you. Like you, it's just you, your list and, and the leaderboard, like you said, and so for you to start something or partner up and then, you know, have the ability to now say we got 40 vehicles. I mean, that's that's a that's a stark difference. So along that journey that you kind of just described, as well as maybe even after that, give us a good decision that you made. Something that just like when we did this, all the dominoes fell for us. What was that major decision that you made that was just really, really good? One decision that we that we made that was a really good decision <laughs> was to keep things simple. We would do theaters and we would do these jobs that would take, I don't know, months. And, you know, if you got, you know, three or four guys on a job, my cats just came in. <laughs> it's all good. He wants to be on TV. <laughs> yeah. He opened the back door himself. Sure. Oh, there you go. But we, we just really decided to, to keep things simple. And, you know, that was a, that was a, a good decision because it let us really focus on doing the, our, our builder thing, you know, getting super hyper focused on a panel and a doorbell in every home, meeting with builders, pitching them, letting them see the value and what that brings to not just them and then their homeowners yeah. because they make money off of this too, you know, yeah. you know, it's a revenue stream for them too. So we got super hyper focused on that. So I would say. That's one good thing that we pivoted on a couple of years ago. And, you know, we're seeing the fruits of it now, even in a downturn market, you know, not a ton of people are willing to give up a 3% interest rate, sell their house and trade it for a 7.5. Right. Right. Um, but, you know, the builder market went down for a little bit, but now it's coming back out of this hole because if I'm going to pay, seven percent interest rate might as well be a brand new house that i can refinance in a couple of years so they're they're starting to pick up and you know they're really moving along so that was that was a good decision for us is to really get super hyper focused on what we should be good at yeah yeah identifying that what do you think for you because obviously you could have installed security systems anywhere because that's what you were doing before why do you, not that, like, why did you choose builders, but how, what was the process that you guys went through to choose that niche? Hey, Chaz Wolf here. As many of you know, I have been on an absolute mission 
to help entrepreneurs from all across the country in many different industries level up their game and grow their business and intentionally connect with other entrepreneurs. We do that obviously through the podcast, but we also have a peer-to-peer mastermind group specifically for seven to nine-figure business owners. We are bringing some of the best and most successful entrepreneurs and minds together in a regular and super intentional way to not only grow our network, but to be able to leverage. And at a certain point in business, success becomes about leverage, leveraging time, leveraging resources, leveraging key relationships. This is exactly what we're doing inside of the peer-to-peer mastermind group called Gathering the Kings, specifically for seven to nine-figure business owners. So if that's you, if you're ready to level up your seven to nine-figure business even to the next level and get around other big hitters just like you, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com, fill out a short application, and uh, it'll come to an application uh, call with me, and I want to chat with you to see if it might be a good fit. Talk soon. The pest control company before, they, they did the same thing. It's a little bit different, but it's not too far off, so, you know, you know, when somebody closed on their house, the termite bond was with this pest control company. We do what we call a welcome visit, and, and that's sort of what we do with the orientation. So a week before somebody closes on their house, they're going to meet with the, the builder. They're going to walk through and talk to them about all the devices or, you know, it, j- even nicks and crannies that need to be fixed and stuff like that. So we, we, wait, we wait out in the vehicle, and when they're done, we come out and we explain the, the program, the the pest control company used to do something very similar to that. They would deliver a welcome gift to the homeowner, and then at that time, they would explain the termite bond, and then when they were there, they would say, hey, while I'm here, let's talk about your pest control. So it weeds out your door knockers and your competition Mm -hmm. uh, because you get to catch them before they even close. So that's, you know, that's where... We just followed suit of, of what those guys were doing, and they were very successful. And we said, you know, if they can do it, we can do it. It's not the same product, but... Same process. Same process, as long as you execute. Yeah. Yeah, and and just your history in sales and knowing that there's obviously a process to sales. Would you say, you know, for the person listening right now who maybe is the sales guy in their company, or maybe he's has a big company, he's got sales teams... Do you think that as a sales top performer and a sales leader that your process that you learned even back in the day has served you now? Has it changed that much or generally is it the same? Like the principles of the process, anything like that? No, I think it all starts with the realization that, you know, it starts with you and ends with you. If you're prepared, then you're going to do well. If you, you know, drill, rehearse, if you find some kind of sales mentor that you like. I'm a big Grant Cardone guy, but there's plenty of people out there. If, if you get obsessed with being an expert in sales, then you'll, then you'll do well. But if you don't put in the time and the effort to get better at it, then you're going to sell some stuff on accident and think that you're a decent salesperson. But most of the time, those people already had their mind made up. That's right. uh, most of the time, you're going to accept for, let me think about it, Email it to me. Let me talk to my wife. If you're not good at, at, at handling objections and being comfortable with that stuff, then it's going to eat you alive. And don't blame the leads. Don't blame the company. You blame yourself because, you know, I, I can motivate you and I can tell you to do this sales training and, and this right here. But if you don't have a drive to, to be good in sales, then I, right. there's nothing I can say to motivate you. Yeah. Yeah. I used to train new sales reps at a large company I worked for years and years ago and similar atmosphere, although it was inside sales as opposed to your outside. And I would ask, you know, sitting in a room of 50, 75, maybe even a hundred new sales reps, I'd come in, <clears throat> I was the top salesperson in the, in the company out of a couple thousand. And I'd say, Hey, look, who wants to make six figures? And obviously every hand goes up. Right. And then it's like, okay, well, who in the last year has done something towards like what you're saying, getting a mentor, reading a book, <laughs> listening to a podcast, like just anything, right? And, you know, some hands go down, some hands are still up. Okay. What about the last six months? Some more hands go down. What about the last three months? Hands go down. What about the last week? Nobody's hand is up, right? It's like, I, I don't know how you expect to come in and get paid extraordinarily by being ordinary. 
yes, you can get into sales quickly. You can get into business quickly. Like you can go, you don't even have to start an LLC. You can just start doing some business, start providing service to somebody. But you're never going to get extraordinary results without mastering certain things, which is in essence what you're saying here. If you don't, for sales specifically, overcome objections, learn how to handle communication with other humans. <laughs> and there's obviously other things with business that the same thing, like you have to learn to master these things. And if you don't, then you're just doing ordinary things, having extraordinary expectations, probably not going to work out so good. Probably going to be pretty frustrated. Like you said, it's going to eat you alive. Would you agree? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you, you don't win the U S open or the masters without spending hours on the driving range. I mean, right. you could, you know, couldn't say I want to be a professional golfer. I don't really like to practice and say, well, right. you might want to find something else that you like yep. doing <laughs> or something. This isn't going to work for you. Yeah. And it's just, you know, it's just crazy. It seems like you're preaching at people because you sort of want to just sort of like shake them and be right. like, dude, dude, you can be, you can make 200,000. You can make 300,000. Like literally sales is an untapped market, man. It depends on if you take these in our scenario, you take these 10 to 20 builder leads and you convert on those, but you're also an absolute hustler that self generate leads. Mm -hmm. network and you're part of this association and you're part of this association and you're omnipresent and everybody knows what you do on Facebook, on Instagram, you're providing content and saying, Hey man, da 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 man, it, it can go nuts for you, but yeah, you got to decide you want to do that. You can't just wish yeah. for it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Everything that you described there is a salesperson running a little mini business. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what most salespeople don't realize. But even as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, maybe they're listening, running a, if, if they're running a sub million, if they're under 1 million in revenue, they're probably not making the two or 300,000 that a sales rep could make at a big company. But both of them have the same like directional challenge, which is run it like a business, like an actual business, be omnipresent, do the marketing, hustle up new leads, create process and SOPs, like all those things, even as an, as a, as a salesperson can can skyrocket your results what about a bad decision something that you did that just didn't work out at all in this company or over i'll give you i'll give you your your whole career whatever comes to mind first i'm curious because you got you've got one there <laughs> oh i would say I, w I mean this is going to not sound good for them but i would say go to it tech was a bad idea for me you know i came from a small town saw all these commercials yeah and like oh Johnny came from nowhere. Now he's surfing with his wife in California. And he's in a, <laughs> he's some kind of communication expert. You know, they were good at those commercials. Yeah. IT tech. And so I, I remember them. <laughs> yeah. I moved here and, and I, I bought all in. I really wanted to become a, a, a MRI CAT scan technician, you know, because okay. I was an electrician before I moved here and I worked in a lot of hospitals. And they would, those guys would fly in. They would put an MRI machine together. And if you've ever seen a cover off on of one of those things, it literally looks like the Terminator. It's, it's yeah. the craziest thing you've ever seen in your life, all these spinning parts. And so that's what I wanted to be. And then when I, you know, I got here and, and you know, I'm about a year into, into school at night. I go, you know, I was a technician and then go there at night and be covered in spider webs and stuff like that. And, <laughs> you know, I was looking around and was like, I think I'm the smartest person in this school. Something ain't right. And, you know, I would realize like all our tests were open book. And then I looked further and I was like, I'm spending all this money and this, this business is not accredited. I should have done my research. And so I finally graduated and I think I owed like $40,000 on a, on a bunch of credits that can't go anywhere. Which uh, I'm not saying that you need education to make it because that obviously helped me none. Yeah. You know, if you can learn to market, promote, sales, mm -hmm. network, you'll be fine. But if I can look back, I, I may have I may have chosen a different school. There was there's a you know I wanted to be a, an electronics technician, and there was there was a there's plenty of them here around Birmingham that are pretty pretty good schools. And so if I could go back, I would say. I wish I would have read the fine print on, on yeah. that because zero of my credits will transfer anywhere ever. Right. And then, right. then they went out of business. Yeah. You know, then they went bankrupt. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that obviously there's an underlying thing there of of you are where you are today because you were where you were. <laughs> but I I feel you on that, man. I I started school and thought I it was a little different thought, but I thought this is not for me, that's for sure. I'm not seeing the point here. We keep doing all he said, the open book test or whatever the thought is. Just like, you know what? Just going to go I'm going to learn sales. So Anyway, just the encouragement to the listener that you're talking to a couple of successful entrepreneurs here. One that's a college dropout, one that did finish. I got to give you the credit, you did finish, but who's who's saying that it's not necessary? I think there's probably you, a lot of people in our camp. I'll tell you even more deeper than that. Like I've made a video about this and told people whenever our 20th, so I graduated in 2000 and 2020 during, you know, during, during the virus, you know, I, there was... I saw a video of a bunch of these people and from my high school walking across the stage and I made a video about it because it sort of hit me emotionally and because I messed around so much in my high school in my senior year that it came down to one test. I really just had a good time my senior year. And so came down to this one test. I studied for like three straight days. I made like a 95 or 96 on this test and it wasn't enough. I, mm. I graduated with a 64.4. I needed a 65. And the teacher, she said, I'm not going to let you slide. Well, I was heartbroken because I was like, you know how many invitations I've sent out? Like, I'm not going to walk across the stage for one tenth of a point. And uh, she said, right. that wouldn't be fair to the rest of the people. So I say that to say all these people came to show up. And I was off in the corner sulking somewhere. Wow. Um, so I didn't walk across the stage. I had to finish during the summer. So just to let you know, nobody gives you anything. Yeah. Nobody gives you anything. So, you know, that was sort of the start of nobody's coming to help you. Yeah. It's time to, so, time to buckle in. Do you think that that's like maybe the seed of what you said earlier? One of your parts of like what beats inside of you is to do it right. Do you think that that maybe stems from that angle of like, at in that moment, you kind of made a decision that like, I'm going to, I'm going to do life on purpose now rather than reactionary. I don't know. I don't know when I became a perfectionist really, because after that I spent a couple of years still pouting around until I decided to pull myself out of being a little baby. I think I just sort of became a more of a perfectionist, maybe a little bit later, whenever I became a, a technician, I like to see things done neatly and mm -hmm. you know if you ever had to go back on your own job which we had to do a lot of times just to fix something or a service issue like or you would go behind somebody else you really you really could see what kind of effort the they put into the job and so yeah. I, I didn't want people coming behind me saying this is terrible did you, yeah I mean, you really spent no time and, and no pride in this job. So yeah, I wouldn't say that that started it. I would say that probably started maybe a little more of a kick into the competing thing and, and saying like, all right, like let's show this town that you're not a loser and that you can defeat the odds and you can yeah. become somebody else. Because, you know, that day I, I, I felt as low as you can feel, you know. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I was a loser that day for sure. So I, you know, don't want to feel like that again. Yeah, it's the chip, the the proverbial chip that we all carry on our shoulder, whether it was somebody else that spoke towards us in a way, or it was ourselves going, "Man, dude, today's not a good day," and I don't want to feel it again. That's for sure. I want to ask you about. I mean, you're a sales guy, so I'm a, I'm gonna assume some of your answer here, but. If you could only track one thing, like, or what's the number one thing you're tracking right now in your business? Let me say it like that. The number one thing that we're tracking right now would be revenue and gross margins. So, you know, we're pretty hyper-focused on the conversion rate of our builders. But this year, we, uh, we got real focused on not giving things away. Like, there's so many companies out there that just to get the agreement... Right. You know, they give a thousand dollars or fifteen hundred dollars off on it, and I know how much the the equipment costs those companies. They obviously get better right. margins than us because they're buying in bigger bulk. Right. But if you're good at what you do, you don't have to give it away. And so, 
That's right. That's where we're, we're focusing on right now is, you know, what's the price per install that you can get? And then what'd you sell that for? What gross margin are you at? You know, we're, we're rolling at a 50% north gross margin on security systems. It's pretty dang good. Yeah. We're not the cheapest, but we're a little more versatile than other companies. So we yeah. feel like we can charge a little bit more and you know, it, there's, it's a very competitive market. I mean, we, I leave sales all the time. I'm back out in the field with my guys selling and stuff like that. And I see there's, you know, certain times where I say, I'm not even going to try to match that. Like it's, right. not, it's not a good business move for me. Yep. So right now we're, we're tracking the, the heck out of margins. Yeah, it's good. It's, it's easy to let go of margin when sales come easy. The last three ish years since COVID, it's just been, you know, sales coming in the door because there's been money everywhere. But I think that you're you're giving the listener actually something really, really quality to be thinking about if they're not already doing it. When times get lean or before times get lean, the focus to margin versus just top line can can really make the difference on whether you weather through a, a downturn of sorts. So whether there'll be one or not, we don't know. But the reality of it is, is that the margin is actually more important because it's what you keep. <laughs> it's not what you make, it's what you keep. So. Yeah. yeah, I sell, you know, we could sell a hundred systems and basically give them all away. And will, will we get that revenue from the monitoring? Yes, that will, that is a machine that churns in the background. But if you give it away, you, the multiple on it, it will take you three years after labor commission and right. the cost of goods sold. It, it, it'll take you the three years to make your money back. So you really ain't going to make a dime on that thing, anybody. even though the background right. is churning, you're not going to make anything for three years. And if they decide they want to jump ship in three years, then you wasted a lot of time, energy, resources. Yep. You wasted a lot of time and made no money. That's right. That's right. You mentioned Grant earlier. I, I built a sales team for him a couple, well, several years ago, but down in Miami at the, the, the 10X headquarters. Anyway, I'm saying that because I want to know of a book resource. Is it, is it Grant? Is it a different book? Like, What would you recommend to the listeners? Go grab off the shelf and, and take a read or listen. Oh, man, I could give you the, the think and grow rich answer if you know that everybody says. But I, I really do think Maybe one of the, the best books that I've read is, you know, it is a grant book, Sell or Be Sold. If you're going to be in sales, you need to realize that there's two transactions that are make, being made right there. You're either selling the customer on yourself, your product, the value that this is the right thing for them to do, or they're selling you to let me think about it. Let me talk to my wife. It's happening one way or another. It just depends on, you know, have you risen enough to make them believe and trust in you? Or are you unprepared enough and didn't right. display enough value to where they sell yeah. you? So, Yeah, it's big. He talks about, I'm curious to hear just your couple of two cents on this as well. In that book, he talks about the idea of being sold yourself and being sold on yourself, being sold on your product so that you can then obviously sell. For sure. In your experience... Is that a 10 out of 10 necessary? Is that a 5 out of 10? Uh, talking to entrepreneurs right now, I mean, they're either selling or they're leading sales teams in their own business. How important is it to be sold on your product or convicted about it, rather? I mean, for, for us, there's a good number of them. I've got a couple new guys who don't have our system in their house yet, but they're going to. Yeah, I mean, it, the easiest thing for me to sell somebody is to show them my phone and the system that I have. That means that I actually use the product that I'm uh, trying to pitch you on. Yeah. So, I mean, my advice would be if, if you won't buy your own product, I don't know how in the world you can convince somebody else to buy it. Yeah. It's, it's, it seems like treason to me. Like, I don't believe you if, <laughs> if you're, you know, if, yeah. if, if I'm at, if I'm if I'm at a Mercedes dealership or a Honda or or, or uh, looking for a Toyota Tacoma, and you tell me that you drive something different, I'm like, man, you're selling Mercedes. Why don't you drive a Mercedes? Like even if it's a '85, like right. I, don't, I don't believe you. Like you're telling me how great Mercedes are, but yet you drive a Honda Accord. Yeah, you're not branded. 
Yeah. So, I man, and that that may be a little bit extreme there. Not everybody, you know, in sales can can afford to buy a Mercedes, but you know, it it really just depends on you know you know the product. Like I said, yeah, you, I think you've got to be sold on your own product before you can sell somebody else. And and what better way to do that than to own it? Yeah. And spend every day with it. That's right. So. Yeah. yeah. Would you sell it to your friends? Would you sell it to your mama? That's right. Yeah. If you won't, then maybe find something else that you trust in. Yeah, exactly. I got one last question here for you, JD. I want to know if you had the opportunity to whisper in the younger JD's ear, what would you tell that guy? Be yourself. Don't worry about what anybody else, you know, thinks about you. Don't go out and try to dominate this world for anybody else other than yourself. You need to make sure you're super happy with who you are before you can go and please other people and lead other people. So figure out who you are, learn about him, like him, and then and then go out and, and do what you're gonna do. But don't do it in reverse. Yeah. Don't go out and just say, because you know, I didn't graduate. I had to learn how to talk again, all these things. So now I'm trying to show the world that, that I'm worthy. No. How about you figure out and accept that you are worthy and then all the other things will come. But don't yeah. do don't do all these things for anybody else. Otherwise it'll it'll be really empty feeling when you yeah. accomplish it. It's good stuff, man. That's deep. Appreciate your perspective. How can the listeners find you? Maybe they're in the southeast region of the United States and they want a, a bomb security system and or audio visual, or maybe they just want to reach out to you and pick your brain as a as a sales guy, as an entrepreneur. How can they connect with you? How can they find you? Yeah, yeah. You can connect with me on Instagram at techboy1. So I'm, I don't know how I got that. Tech boy one seems like somebody big would have that. But <laughs> at, at tech boy one, Facebook, John Daniel Broadwater or JD Broadwater is my, my business page. Shoot me a message on either of those. Uh, I'll definitely respond to it. Our website, www.callchorus.com is, our, is our, our business in Birmingham. We also acquired a company out of Texas called BSG. So BSG of Texas, either one of those. Like I said, call our office, 205-978-1234. Tell them you want to talk to me. I'd be glad to uh, glad to, uh, to chat with you and, you know, anything you want to discuss. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Appreciate your openness to, to chat with listeners and uh, they can bring some business your way, bring some new sales. Appreciate your time. Blessings on your family, your business, your partners, all that you got your hand to in 2023. Thanks for being here, J.D. Thank you so much for having me, man. I appreciate you. Thank you for listening to Gathering the Kings today. I hope that you were able to pull out a few nuggets to go apply into your business right away. More importantly, though, I hope that you're realizing that it takes more to be successful than just being by yourself, doing it all on your own, carrying the weight all by yourself. What I have realized, not only in my own journey from multiple businesses and multiple different industries and now interviewing over two or 300 other very successful seven, eight and nine figure business owners is that it's tough to do it alone. And so Gathering the Kings exists to bring together successful entrepreneurs. In fact, we are putting together 1000 Kings specifically who are grateful, but not done. We're intentionally assembling Kings who fight tooth and nail for their business, family and communities. And here's what we believe that in the pursuit of excellence in those areas, that it ignites within us the responsibility to govern power and forge a lasting legacy. So if that relates and, and resonates with you, and you know that you need people around you, sharp, qualified, other very successful business owners, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com. I want you to take a look at what we're doing and see if it makes sense for you to be part of our pursuit to 1,000 Kings. Talk soon.